back to Knoxville. I was here 30 years ago as the assistant women's track and field coach in charge of sprints and hurdles. Um, I was 10 years old then, kind of started early. Um, but it's great to come back. They're going to give me just a couple minutes over since I have about three hours worth of material to present to you. But it's been a long morning already, great speakers, but mental fatigue is starting to set in. So we're going to do a little mental gymnastics, okay? It won't be real difficult. Pick a number between 1 and 10. Don't tell me what it is. If you've seen me perform this feat before, please don't spoil it for anyone else. You have your number? Multiply that number by 9. This is the hardest math you'll have to do today. Multiply your number by 9. Now, take the number that's in the 1's column and the number that's in the 10's column on your number. Add those together. You have that? So you've got a single digit number now. I want you to subtract from that single digit number 5. Now you've got another single digit number, the remainder. The more you get to know me, the more you realize that I love numerology. So numerology is when you assign each letter of the alphabet a number. Okay, so A would be 1, Z would be, in English it's 26. We're speaking in English, by the way, today. Your current number that you have, the remainder, corresponds with a letter of the alphabet. Can you visualize that letter for me? First European country that starts with that letter. Think of it. Go to the end of your country name. There's another letter there. Can you see it? First animal that starts with that letter. Go to the end of your animal name. See that letter? First color that comes to your mind. Hold on a second. I'm seeing an orange kangaroo from Denmark. <laughs> Did anybody have that? What does this mean? Does this mean that I've been given some rare psychic gift that I can simultaneously read people's minds? No. Doesn't mean that at all. How about if I cheated? I didn't do that. But if I'm lucky enough to be able to guess that, I need to head out to the casino right now. What I did is I used a very specific system that yields a highly predictable result. It's a specific system, but it yields a highly predictable result. What we're going to do today is share with you, regarding the 40-yard dash, parts of a system that you can use that's based on research, based on research and time tested, that you can take home on Monday and start working with your players, working with your athletes to improve their 40-yard dash. Now, what does the 40-yard dash mean, particularly relative to football? How many people sat for hours and watched the combine? Yeah, I know, I did too. And the resounding theme was, hey, look, the 40-yard dash doesn't really translate into being a football player. Then why is so much weight put on the 40-yard dash? Because it's an indicator of what your speed capacity is. And particularly looking at the 10-yard time, what your acceleration capacity is. And couple that with broad jump and vertical jump, now you get a picture of how the athlete's nervous system works and what their limitations are going to be versus what their capacities can possibly be. 
This is how it worked for one of our clients, and hopefully it'll play loud enough. So I'll narrate. Stephen Hills, wide receiver Georgia Tech, came out as a junior. Everybody's talking about uh, some of the other receivers that ran before him. They really thought he was going to run about 11 six, or about a 4 6 or 4 7. Another big body, wide out, but because of the offense run, 6 4 215. Very few opportunities. He only had 28 catches in that option offense, but he averaged 29 yards a catch. Well, it, wasn't it the same thing with Demarius Thomas? Cor correct. The same exact and thing. And Calvin Johnson. To a that number is 4 3 0. That's what I was just going to say. 6 foot 4, one inch shorter than Usain Bolt. 215 pounds, about the same weight. Ram is a track kid. Danny Cole This is the second run. Punt returner. How about Danny Cole punted a bunch of times this year? He returned punts. He's a slot receiver. They're talking about pounds. other people. And now Hill, who, according to our unofficial hand time, had the fastest 40, uh, just wow. ran a 4 3 1. Okay, so. Do you think he made some money on that day? <laughs> if you rock on up to the combine in Indianapolis and you run two, three, or even four tenths of a second faster than the pro scouts are expecting you to run, that changes your future forever. Changes your future forever. Now, what would it do for your high school players to be able to run four tenths of a second faster? Well, speed is the single biggest determinant that picks who plays and who doesn't play <laughs> at every level of sport and almost in every sport. Typically, the faster people are the ones that are spending more time on the field. And so they're on the field more, they enjoy the experience, they have fun, and the likelihood that they're going to continue to participate and play the rest of their lives because they enjoy it now is huge. And so, although I would be remiss in, in uh, trying to tell you that I can make a Kentucky Derby winner out of a plow mule, everyone can get faster. And so you need to examine your speed philosophy. Over and over and over on the telecast at NFL Network, Coaches, former coaches, former players who are doing commentating, the resounding message that was being sent, either you got it or you don't. If you're not as fast as you'd like to be, you did a poor job of picking your parents. And so we need to examine that as, examine that as coaches and educators, mostly educators. Is that really true? And so, you have to understand that speed is a skill, and just like any other skill, it can be improved by coaches who know how to teach it. Where would all of the quarterbacks, the great quarterbacks, be if some father or some coach had spent literally hours teaching them how to throw a football? That's not something that you emerge from the womb having that capacity. It takes time to teach it. Any coach can make you tired. Many of mine did. I'm sure plenty of yours did. Working harder doesn't necessarily make you faster. What we want to try to do is we want to be teachers and coaches. Now, um, one of the slides this morning talked about, there was a line in there about work capacity. Working hard doesn't, not, doesn't necessarily increase work capacity. Work capacity is the quality or the ability to maintain quality of movement, which means how perfect is that movement, and intensity of movement. So quality and intensity under ever-increasing volumetric loads. It is a lot more to do than just being able to survive the training session that day. 
And that's a lot more than just creating aerobic capacity or aerobic endurance qualities. The other thing about work capacity is there is a psychological component to work capacity. People that are experts in their field train about five or six hours a day. And the single biggest challenge that they have is how do I maintain the quality and the intensity in the last bit, the last hour of the training day? How can I make sure that my last reps are as good as my first reps? How am I going to be as mentally sharp? The defensive backs in the first group at the NFL Combine were out there six and a half hours. They did an unbelievable number of position drills. The second group was an hour and 15 minutes late starting. How do you prepare your players to go through an ordeal like that? Maybe it's a game, maybe it's a long travel to get to a game and delays and, 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 and. Now what they've got to do is they've got to run the three cone drill. They've got to run the pro agility. And for those who still had enough gas in the tank, they even gave a shot at running the 60-yard uh, the shuttle, the long shuttle. A lot of people bagged it. A lot of DBs in that first group did not even bother running the agility. They were so mentally shot that they just shut it down and figured they'd do it at pro day. Work capacity is huge. We need to teach our players how to reprogram their nervous system. And it's not just necessarily by uh, repetition. They need to create a conceptual technical model of what they're trying to do. When they run that video in their head and put themselves in that video, they need to be able to see the movement executed perfectly. This is why I tell coaches, if you're not really good at doing the drills, don't. Because as soon as you do a drill, and I'm moving away from that myself now, as soon as you do a drill the first time for an athlete, that is their picture. That is their template. That is what they're going to try to emulate. And so the benefit of having upperclassmen under your tutelage, having gone through the program, so that you can use them as models, will fast track your underclassmen in terms of their development. And lastly, coaching is teaching while training. It really is all about teaching the athlete how to reprogram their nervous system. Now, what are we going to work on on a daily basis, on, a, on an hourly basis, in order to try to increase our athlete's speed? Two different things in their mission statement. Don't keep this a secret from them. Share this with them so that they understand what they're trying to do. The first thing they're trying to do is reduce the amount of time that it takes to put the needed force into the ground by a hundredth of a second. Almost infinitesimally small. When you figure by the time you turn on a stopwatch and turn it off, you've gone by, you've gone by ten hundredths of a second. It's tough to do it in less than the tenth of a second. And at the same time, the athletes are working on reducing the amount of time that it takes to put the force in the ground, the needed force into the ground. We're going to teach them how to recover the limb through that optimal range of motion and put it back down onto the ground in one one hundredth of a second less time. Well, if you can do that, it takes most players college players, about 20 steps, about 20 steps in the 40-yard dash. High school players, because their power and their strength hasn't been fully developed yet, maybe a couple more. If you're really fast, you can get by in about 19 steps. Now, simple math, save a hundredth of a second on the ground, save a hundredth second in the air, for 20 steps, man, that's four tenths of a second. We had several players, not just big guys, improve by three to four hundredths of a second. 
in their 40 from the time they rocked on up in early January to the time they showed up in Indianapolis. Let's look at the phases of the 40. And preparing high school athletes is tremendously important, particularly as colleges start recruiting and looking at talent younger and younger to be able to, if you choose to suggest your athletes go to some of these showcase combines, be able to have them show out well. Pre-preparation, it's a psychological component as well as a physical component. Creating an active dynamic warm-up that actually wakes up the nervous system instead of putting it to sleep. In the mid-1980s, we talked about the desensitization of the stretch receptor by long hold static stretching. People thought we had three heads and were from the moon. Now the literature is replete with information that says, if I take you and measure your vertical jump right now, take you through a long hold static stretching program and have you jump again, you're not going to be able to jump as high. It reduces your power output. But still, as I travel around the world, this is, this is news to a lot, of, a lot of people. And so active dynamic warm-up, psychological preparation that's needed in order to be able to do a one-off or a two-off performance. Big thing that I talked about on, uh, on radio yesterday in Atlanta was Athletes that have a track and field background do better at testing these parameters oftentimes than people that have specialized from an early age playing football. If you're out there going to run the 100 meters or going to long jump, you don't have 10 of your friends out there to support you. And so broad-based sport development teaches the, teaches the skill set but also teaches the mental set to be able to perform when the spotlight is on you and not on the entire team. But it also goes to what you're thinking about. You need to be able to visualize the entire 40 meters run by you, executing perfectly, getting your breath points at the right spot, and finishing strong through the line before you put your hand down on the ground. There's too many times, if you look at just the amount of time that a person puts their hand on the ground versus the time they go, the longer you're in that, in that uh, three-point position, the more the energy gets sapped from your legs. You're less explosive the longer you hold. Talk to track and field athletes. They hate to be held for, for uh, you know, a couple, tenths, a couple seconds, rather. Three-tenths, four-tenths of a second. The whole concept about loading yourself into the three-point position. It has to be consistent. You have to do it the same every time. There's no time for goofing around when you practice. It's like asking a black belt to come in here and break a bunch of bricks. They take, they put their stance, they get settled, they put their left hand on the bricks. One, two, break the bricks. Ask them to do that with their hand behind their back now. Won't happen. If they try it, their hand will be the consistency of mashed potatoes. It has to be consistent. It has to be any pre-activation you use. And I encourage this. Three explosive jumps up in the air, dynamic cut jumps, rebounds, open up the neural drive. There was no accident in the 1972 at the Olympic Games in Munich that Valerie Bortsoff jumped three times in the air before he got into the blocks. They already understood the importance of activating the nervous system being more explosive. The start, and this is where people spend a lot of time. Interestingly, your 10 yard time, and particularly the velocity that you're traveling at 10 yards, is the single biggest thing that impacts your time from 10 to 20. There's a high, high correlation there. So it's well worth practicing this. The other thing in the game of football, there's very rare times where you don't go 10 yards and you have to change direction. And so understanding that dynamic is, is extremely important. 20 to 40, a little bit different situation, and we're going to talk about that. So the start, pure acceleration, 
maximum velocity, and we also can talk about a transition phase in there, which it not, doesn't appear on this slide, but pure acceleration, a transition phase, maximum velocity, and the finish. Now, you would think in less than six seconds, people wouldn't have problems with decelerating. Not true. When we're working on our top speed phase and we're having them go from a three point, we're having them run 45 or 50 yards so that they can have the capacity to be able to finish strong after 40. You see a lot of guys, they start to have their form break down at 30, 35 yards. So even though this isn't a classic speed endurance, model speed endurance, particularly takes over after about six seconds, from a neuromuscular capacity standpoint or a neuromuscular endurance standpoint, these guys don't have a chance to go maximum intensity for that amount of time in either preparation for, uh, in training and preparation for a game or in the game itself. Now the start, think of it as the reaction, force application, and the first two steps. The first two steps are decidedly different than the other steps during acceleration. The first step, the landing on the first step is the hardest step in the 40 yard dash. This is where more is lost than in any other place with the exception of the double foot force application in, the, in that initial charge. And so determining the front foot and one of my colleagues, Rob Harris, back here reminded, reminded me of this, so I'm going to say it now. Every year we have guys that are coming in and they're left tackles. That's the stance. That's not, the ne that's not necessarily the way their nervous system is naturally wired. It behooves them in the 40-yard dash, instead of having their front foot forward, to actually have their left foot forward, their, their right versus their left and we'll work on changing them around if it's so indicated. Now, in setting a stance for the 40-yard dash, we're trying to select the most neurobiomechanically efficient stance that they could possibly have. This ain't your football stance. If you're at the combine and you're in your pro day, you probably aren't going to have to run a 40-yard dash again in your life, with the exception of maybe impressing a team if you're coming on as a, a possible free agent. People say, get in a comfortable stance. So that, that lineman says, coach, that's not comfortable. Comfortable is all in what you're used to. And I'll tell the guys, I mean, you can do this and be comfortable and be as slow as you've always been, or you can make some modifications and get in a better biomechanical position and improve your speed, and over time, that's going to be comfortable. Your wallet's going to be more comfortable, too. And so rarely have we ever reverted and, and you know, acquiesced almost and allowed the player to go from a, a bad biomechanical position. How do we determine it? Everybody is open and ready to go today. I can't find one person with their... This is amazing. Sir, I would put your left foot back in the stance. I would put your left foot back in the stance. Any truth to that? If you had to come out of a like, starting block like a track and field athlete, you would put your left foot forward. Okay. Everybody fold your arms on your chest. The arm that's laying next to your body, Greg Cook, your left, your left foot would be back. Your left your arm that's laying next to your body is likely the foot that you would have back in your stance. That's called the quick side. That's the side that moved first when your arms came together. If they both moved at the same time, they would be hitting in the middle. The other side is called your power side. Ironically, it's a misnomer. More power is generated from your back leg than your front leg. And we're going to talk about that in the middle. Now, does this always work? No, because through nurture and, you know, if you were a hurdler or 
you always played uh, on the left side of the line, or always played on the right side of the line, your right foot's back. There are some, there are some differences there. So folding your arms on your chest is one way to do it. Which foot would you punt the football the furthest with? That's probably the foot that goes back in your stance. For your 40, if you can kick a foot, the, uh, football the furthest with your right foot, that's probably the foot that goes back or should go back, I'm sorry, but that's probably the foot that should have gone back many years ago in your 40. And the last thing is called a hop, hop, start. What we're going to do is put them in an even stance, hop, hop, and then have them come out, charge out, and run. The leg that they step with is probably going to be the foot that's back in their stance. So there's three relatively easy ways you can check to see if you've got your athletes in the right stance for their, their level of uh, neuro, neuromuscular coordination. Foot from the line. It wasn't until a couple years ago that the NFL said, we're going to determine where you put your hand in your front foot. The reason why is because they didn't know what was better. Was it better to be further away? Was it better to be close? Let's have everybody do it roughly the same. So regardless if you had a size 9 shoe or a size 17 shoe, everybody started from the same place. It was different this year. Go back and look at the tape. There's all sorts of different stuff that's being used. Which is the biomechanically most efficient way to do it for a three-point stance, remember, not a track and field block start. We're talking similar principles, different application. So, does anyone remember in track and field coaching, especially if you were in Ohio, 20 years ago, there was a block that was out there called the Moy starting block. You basically put the front pedal about one foot length away from the starting line. And it was kind of a pyramid looking start, not dissimilar to what the old, I'm going even further back, what the old wide receivers used to line up like. And Remy Korchemny back in 1988 with the, the world junior team with the United States with all of the guys, no one had previous experience with this starting technique before. All of the guys started faster to 10, 10 meters and 20 meters. One guy had previous experience, Chris Nelms. And so the Moy start puts you in roughly this kind of a stance position that's going to be optimal for a three-point start, not having any pedals to push off of. So. The other consideration is, between the front foot and the rear foot, what's that distance going to be? And what we found is it's about one to one and a half foot lengths uh, uh, from the front heel. Let me take that back one second. So, front foot to the line, it doesn't say it up there, somewhere between one foot length and a foot length and a half. So under the, old, under the old convention, with the starting line here, we would have them set up with their toes on the line, and they would take their front foot and put it back toe-heel relationship or a little bit further, not more than a half a foot length further. The next, the next one we would take, and we would take and put this back about one foot length maybe just a little bit further. So we're in that, we're in that range. Now, you're going to make adjustments relative to leg length, body length, arm length, so that we can, the goal is, put the center of mass in front of the front foot. Because if the center of mass doesn't get to be in front of the front foot, we, we can't push, we can't go anywhere when we start to charge. Stance, hand position. You want to have that hand high up on a bridge with the weight on your, on your fingers and your thumb. And the elbow needs to be pointing down the field. That means I'm going to 
externally rotate at the shoulder and lock it in. This is going to give us a strong, strong position. The front arm is going to be slightly unlocked. It's not going to be hyperextended. It's going to be unlocked. This allows you the best position at the shoulder and the best position at the elbow to generate force at the shoulder to balance, to balance the force that's being generated in that kind of ready position. Take your hands, put them together like this, press. Okay, what did you just do? Yes, it was an isometric contraction, but those of you who have an engineering background would recognize this as a balanced force. The force in one direction is going to be pushing equal and opposite uh, direction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a situation where I can use the fourth type of jump in human movement. It's called a catapult jump. You know, back in the day, they used to put a burn and earn a churn and funk on a stick, stretch it down, and shoot it over a gap to the wall. Well, what we're doing here is, what I'm going to do is I'm going to press, and then I'm going to take away the resistance, which is the hand. And you shoot forward. So in that three-point stance, you're not like a three-legged bar stool. You're creating creative tension, pushing backward, and you're resisting that with the strength of your shoulder. Now, the next thing, and this is, I'm going to point this out because this is a difference in terms of track and field versus football three-point. That's not a difference. What I'm talking about here is I want to have the arm drop directly down from the shoulder. So you end up being in kind of a little triangle position. So the hand is just a little bit outside the foot. The thumb lines up kind of with the big toe. If you can, if you can visualize that. Shoulder position. This is different. You want to be able to get your shoulder further forward than you would in a, in a, in a, uh, a block start. Now this is what we've always been taught. You've got to lean out a little bit. By displacing your shoulder forward, you're able to shift the hip and the center of mass so that when we drop that down, that drops down in front of the base of support. And so you can see Tandon here, he's got his shoulder out forward. Now, this is one of the reasons why you bench press for the 40, is to be able to stabilize. Remember, he's loading, he's loading that rear heel. So he's creating force from his glutes and his hamstring and hip extension that he has to counterbalance now. The head position is going to be a prolongation of the back. You don't want to have your chin on your chest. Maurice Green was one of the, the guys that changed starting in track and field because they thought if they had their head down it could keep them in a drive position better. John Drummond, his training partner two years ago, who was coaching in Dallas, Texas, said, you know, we used to think that, but now that I'm a coach and I understand the biomechanics, we were just running with our head down. So thousands of people copied more recent this. Maybe it wasn't biomechanically the best way to do it. So keep that, keep that head of prolongation. The counterpart of that is if your head is up, what ends up happening is that tips your pelvis down, that destroys your body position. Destroys your body position. Hip position, your, hip, your hips are going to be well above your shoulders. And so, again, if you go back and look at some of the tapes, there's all sorts of different things. With football players, particularly the big guys, we do not want to have hyper-acute thigh-to-body angles. We don't want to be down in a, in a deep squat position, inverted, with our hand on the ground. We want to be in a more of a power position such that the athletes can unload and come out and explode with the back leg and the front leg simultaneously, and they don't have a sticking point in there. If you get them down in more of a track start, you're going to have a sticking point because there's nothing to push against. You can't get away with the same things you can in the track start. Now, I apologize for um, 
not having a bigger image. We can see right here, we're looking at the, hmm, it's supposed to be a light. Looking at 97 degrees on that front leg. So this is our wide receiver. You can see head in line with the back, uh, arm straight, shoulder slightly forward. He's about a foot length and a half, a foot length and a quarter from front foot to hand. You can see that if his toe on the rear foot was even with his heel, that would be one foot. He's foot length, he's a little bit greater than that. And so everything we've said, he's lined up pretty well for. Now, and this is, this is all set up by where you put your feet in your hand. Rear leg, it's about 134 degrees in this one, about 135. Track and field starts oftentimes are 120 to 140. So we're in the most powerful position to apply force with that rear leg. Remember, greater power is generated from the rear leg than the front leg in the start. Location of the center of mass. The line is wrong. And so you'll see a thin little line. I'm going to go up and point to it because my, oh, there's my dot. Right here, that's where the center of mass is. If we drop a line straight down, that needs to fall in front of the foot. So when you're in an inverted position, an inverted squat position, the center of mass actually shifts outside your body. But we want the center of mass to fall, it only happens when I work for, uh, right down here, right down in front of the front of the front of the foot. That way when he explodes, he goes that way. If the center of mass is above the foot, there's a good chance he's going to go straight up this way. One of the reasons why people stand up out of their charge. Now, front foot, or rather the, uh, the arm on the upside, this is the single biggest signal for hand timers to start the clock. The arm that's up here like this, invariably it will do this before they go. And so one easy thing is to keep the arm pinned against the hip. Put, put that there, a little bit of pressure to hold it in, and that way it doesn't have a false movement backwards which starts the timer before you move, it goes right forward. Now, what if somebody's really resistant to that? What if, regardless of how you pin that thing down outside of sticking it in their pocket, it still wants to go backwards? Right here. Can't go backwards from here. Okay? If you've got an athlete, and again, many of the high school combines are going to fully automatic times, but manual times are still prevalent, that'll start a manual time. If you have that arm here, it won't move. It goes up and forward right away. Now, look at the white t-shirt runner. That's, that's uh, 8th of January. The guy without the shirt on, same guy, 8th of February. And so what you see is, first of all, time to five yards. Well, first of all, time to get off the front foot from first movement to takeoff. First movement to takeoff. 38 hundredths of a second. Now, here's what's confusing here. That's shot at, a, at the equivalent frame rate of 600 frames per second. So you've got to divide that number, that three-point number, by 10. So instead of being 0.38, it's 0.30. He's just saved eight hundredths of a second before he's taken his first step, just in terms of his stance acceleration that he's coming out of learning how to have double foot force application. The other thing that's really noticeable here 
is because his center of mass in January was further behind, we didn't give him a lot of instruction, he's going up at a 45 degree angle. Now you might think, particularly if you were in the artillery, that a 45 degree shot is going to go the furthest that you possibly can with your, with your artillery. Maybe so. But we want to get the foot back down on the ground sooner. It's a pretty well proven thing that you cannot accelerate while you're floating through the air. There is nothing to push on. And so on his second run, he's at about 37 degrees. So the displacement is more horizontal and less vertical. Consequently, what we're going to see is we're going to see him go up in the set position, front arm is pressed against the hip, there's a rear heel load. And so with my rear foot, I'm going to fire my glutes and my hamstrings to cause the heel to sink a little bit. It has to be minimum 90 degrees. Minimum 90 degrees. We want to have that load. And the foot has to be firm. And what I mean by that is, when they bang their heel, when they bang that rear heel to initiate the movement, I don't want to see a lot of absorption. I don't want to see that thing go all the way through an unbelievable range of motion. You have to co-contract the musculature around the ankle in order for me to feel like there's a starting block back there. That's not going to let me go down. Now, what's the biggest mistake that causes um, significant absorption at the angle? at the ankle, a straight rear leg. Because when the rear leg knee is straight, that changes the dynamic of the shin angle, which allows the athlete to go through further, further range of motion and consequently waste time and not apply force as effectively. And so with that rear heel load and a, and a firm foot, We're going we're gonna to work on, again, pinning that up for the, the hip, and then with initiation, they're going to bang the rear heel. They're going to bang the rear heel. And so what that, what that looks like is it looks like this. If you talk to really top track and field sprinters, this is what they'll tell you it feels like. Not this. You see what I'm saying? They bang the heel, you've got a firm foot, so you're getting tremendous stored elastic energy, and then you've got to yank the foot forward. You've got to yank it forward. You're not worried with the rear block about getting triple extension reflex. You have a triple extension movement. You've got to bang it, pull it out. When well, we did the analysis of our guys in January, right after they did the mock first mock combine, the biggest problem with them was they couldn't keep up with the model's rear leg. Couldn't keep up with the model's rear leg. And so consequently, when you bang the rear heel, you have a simultaneous force application with both, both feet. If you put this player on an independent force platform, you want to see both forces increase simultaneously. You don't want to get hit here, then get hit here. Probably survive that. If two people hit you simultaneously, a little bit greater force. And that's what you want to do is maximize, maximize that force. Double foot force application. Now. So, from an arm, arm action standpoint, we want to sweep the rear arm. Now, this is like, almost like an afterthought. We teach our players that you want to run away from your hand. Your downside hand, you want to feel like you're running away from that thing. There's two ways to move the hand. The preferred way is to sweep it back long. So I'm here. It's going to come back long. The upper body withdrawal reflex, if you ever had a, a cast iron pan 
And you know the way you clean it, you don't use soap or hot water, you kind of scrub the bits out, and then you put it on the stove, and you kind of cook the water out of it, and it gets pretty hot, and then you leave the kitchen and wait for your spouse or your significant other to come and touch it and move it. This is what happens. That's what the athlete will do here. This is a signal. This is a signal to start to watch. Now, you can't cheat. You can't cheat the combine. They're trying to use a beam now to break it. But if you bang the heel, even if you leave your arm poker straight, because your body's coming up and forward, your arm will come off the ground. And so you can't beat the auto timer. But by sweeping the arm back, you generate the needed time to apply force on the front leg. He was able to do it in, in, in three tenths of a second. That's really good. That's even, that's even good for a track and field male sprinter. Three tenths of a second is really good. But when you consider the next step, it should be 14 hundredths of a second. It's half. And so if I do this, I'm not going through the full range of motion to balance force application on my opposite side hip, my front leg hip. Full sweep action back here through good range of motion generates more force production on the right hip. The other thing it does is firing the lats and the glutes simultaneously you get cold contraction and you stabilize the lumbar spine through this big tendon that's attaching to the lumbar vertebra there. Small thing. All we're looking for is a couple thousands of a tenth second here, a couple thousands of a second there. And so sweeping that arm back is, is going to be real, real important. I get ahead of myself. Forearm shiver. Do you all remember? If you're my age, when the forearm shiver was actually a legal maneuver, some of you don't even know what it is. Here's what it is. When we played with leather helmets and no face guards, we used to be able to take our forearm and come up underneath someone's chin. Now, if that's ever happened to you, here's what, it, here's what you do when that happens. It literally, I know you've done it now, or at least maybe I'm receiving it, but it literally makes you shiver. And so what I want to do is from either this position where my arm is pinned on my hip or if I have to rest it on my thigh, I want to deliver a forearm shiver. Forearm shiver up. i got to get full range of motion. I want my force, I want my force to come right through my power line. Your power line is the line of force from your ankle, your knee, your hip, your shoulder, right out through your elbow. Well, why don't I just punch like this? If you do this, your arm, your humerus, runs into your acromion process and you can't go through full range of motion. By internally rotating, you can go up through this range of motion. Watch some of the top starters in the world in track and field and you'll see that motion. Now, some of the guys, six weeks, that's the least of our concerns. But when they hit it, here's what they tell you. It felt like my arm pulled me right out of my stance. Now, mechanically, is that possible? Eh, probably not. But it does get you in a better alignment and get your hips further forward, rather than bringing your back up into, uh, into hyperextension. Now, the other thing is, and I used to be 100%, if you go back and look at the speed dynamics tapes, I used to be 100% against driving the arms forward. Not so much anymore, because we know now that if you want to generate higher thigh speed forward and hip flexion, moving your arm forward does that. I go back to my own, my own experience as a soccer player at the University of Wisconsin, trying to learn how to use my left foot for something other than standing on, and the only way I could do it when I was shooting was focus on my right arm coming forward. So with my right arm coming forward, I can hit the ball pretty well because the right arm determines that the thigh comes forward. What we're going to learn in the second here is that the most important thing in acceleration and top speed is you've got to get the thigh from the back side of the body to the front side of the body. The more it, the more it hangs behind here and extends once you leave the ground, the technical term for that is dangle time, by the way. 
not a technical term. But we got to get it forward. That's why having the arm come forward is significant as part of a coaching cue strategy. There's going to be times when we want to drive it back. That rear arm, we want to drive that back to get more extension. Front arm, we want to drive it forward so we can get the thigh to come forward. Okay? Got to pop the thigh forward. We promote that power line position that we talked about. Exaggerated range of motion again balances that time requirement. We've got to yank the foot off the ground. Literally, hit it and yank it. Hit it and yank it. And so we have guys standing there before they get in the blocks in our, in our practices working on just here, that type of an action. Now, again, let's talk about a little bit of the challenge with triple extension. Triple extension means extending at the hip, the knee, and also the ankle joint. If I do this, I lose the capacity of that ground reaction force to facilitate my thigh coming forward. And so the biggest thing over the last 10 days between our second mock combine and the NFL combine was keep your ankle cocked. Don't try to push from your ankle so that when you run, you run like this. Keep that foot firm. Get the big power from the hip. Get the big power from the quad. Don't worry about that last little bit. You know what the 80-20 rule is? 80% of the force comes from uh, contraction of the muscles around the hip joint and the knee joint. That all goes into stored elastic energy at the ankle joint. 20% of the force comes from contraction of the ankle joint muscles. Save time. Don't worry about the 20%, that 20 cents on the dollar. Get it going forward again so you can get another 80 sooner. Makes economic sense. And it has to be active. This isn't something that just happens because you put a stretch across the, the hip muscles. It has to be active and it has to be aggressive. Work on that thigh pop, pop of the thigh forward. First step landing, toughest thing, toughest thing. You've got to set it up with a low recovery. You've got to set it up with a low recovery. And so right in here, I'm going to hit a foot pop, bang the heel, pop the thigh. Right there. It's literally almost scrapes the ground. If you look at some of Usain Bolt's better starts, and in fact the world record run that he had in Berlin, his second step dragged the ground. It's that low. It gets back to the ground that soon. It's about five or six hundredths of a second that it takes that thing to recover and get back down onto the ground. It's extremely, extremely fast. But it's time to apply force again right away. And so the person that Picks the heel up, you're dead. You've got to keep a little bit of fixation in the knee joint so that, that foot can scrape right across the ground. This engages the rectus femoris as a hip flexor. Most people flex their hips with their iliopsoas, a little bit, little bit glute minimus, um, tensor fascia lata, but because the knee is bending here, they don't get the recruitment that they need out of the rectus femoris. My British sprinter, she's been with me now, what she says is, it's like being on the tube in London and being insulted during rush hour. You want to pay him back, so you do this. <clears throat> you kick him in the shins. Kick him in the shins. And what happens when you really kick someone in the shins quick? Your hamstrings engage and cause an active response, bringing that foot down to the ground. Active response, bringing that foot down to the ground. Now, if you teach this three hours a day and you're demonstrating, you'll see what I mean, because the first day you're walking around, I got a, my hamstring feels like it's going to pull. And so, 
working on that's real important. Land on a firm foot, contact behind the center of mass. Second step, same thing. Same thing. So, first eight steps is pure acceleration. This is the difference. Remember, divide the second one by 10, move that decimal point. This is the difference that we see in the, uh, in the first 10. Just look at the position. Look at the position of the foot here. Ankle cock, notice how that's getting ready to really slam back in the ground. At the same point, look at how low that foot is here. You want to keep it low to the ground and get it back on the ground soon, but this is like you and me getting into a hitting contest. We're going to hit each other in the shoulder. You get to hit me from this far. I get to hit you from this far. Who's likely going to win? That one right there. Greater ability to generate negative thigh speed, greater ability to generate negative foot speed, and you're able to really bang the ground a lot, a lot better. The duration of pure acceleration, which is about the first six or eight steps, is about two seconds. This is where force production is um, largely predominated by muscle contraction. This is why we had a defensive lineman, kind of a tweener linebacker, run one five seven for the first ten. Extremely explosive. Extremely explosive. You see some of these big linemen, they're running in the one sixes. Extremely explosive using muscle contraction. After two seconds, all the way to the forty, a greater predominance of stored elastic energy is used to produce a big force in a short time to generate that high turnover. You want to think push, pull, push, pull, push, pull. And the change of the power line will also be the change in direction or the change in velocity. So even though our fellow on the right is going faster, if you draw a line from his ankle up through his uh, head, you can see it's a whole different dynamic in terms of that ankle if we, angle if we drew that on the guy with the white shirt. Transition phase, I'm just going to go through this real quickly. Absolute velocity or maximum velocity. I wanted to get to this slide here. This is at 20 yards, so he's not even at his full speed yet. Notice at takeoff, he's at 152 degrees. If you see your players at, at 170 or more, almost straight, they were braking when they landed on that step. So at touchdown, they put the brakes on, their hips slowed down, now they have to spend time pushing in order to reaccelerate up to the level that they were coming in. And so the fastest athletes are the ones who learn how to be more like a Super Bowl and less like a, uh, a, a bean bag. Couple things here. Key point, when the thigh is perpendicular to the ground, and, and he could do a lot better at this, when the thigh is perpendicular to the ground, I want to see a right angle at the knee joint. So again, white shirt January, this February. Gotten a lot better, still could be better. <laughs> now this doesn't, does this mean butt kick exercises are bad? Not necessarily as long as the thigh is coming forward at the same time. If you're butt kicking back here, they look like they're trying to comb their hair with their spikes, their cleats, you're teaching the wrong thing. You've got to get the thigh forward when the heel comes up. And you can see they're hitting roughly the same position here. Um, but our one on the right is hitting it much sooner. Okay, now back on the ground when the knee when the when the foot's on the ground, this one has already been on the ground a while. This one's not on the ground. The knees need to be together here. Big intra thigh angle here means that leg was dangling back behind the body. We've got to correct things at the takeoff. Get the thigh to come forward. Be more aggressive there.
One or two more slides before I get to hook. The sharpest knee angle, the sharpest knee angle should be when the heel crosses the ankle. That's where the sharpest knee angle should be. When you get your fullest, fullest flexion at the knee, that's when your leg starts to unwind. And you can't get that good high knee look that athletes are looking for. So if you achieve, if you achieve maximum knee angle, so he's already he's already unwinding here. He's already unwinding. His maximum knee angle was about 45 degrees. When he's at ankle cross, he's already starting to open up. And this is the telltale thing of what I'm going to end on. I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to go through the video. This is the time for one stride. Now, unfortunately, it's measured from different points, but it's the time for one stride. So this is the time that it took him to take one stride. How many strides per second is that? Four strides per second. That's very, very average. Very, very average. How much, how much faster is he going here? 23 hundredths of a second. Folks, that's 17 hundredths of a second per stride with a guy that's already pretty fast. And so save a little time on the ground, save a little time in the air by teaching proper technique, keep them in the weight room. The, the best thing about football players working with track and field, particularly men, um, they usually don't have any strength, they don't, usually don't have any strength uh, problems. They're all strong enough. If you ever have an opportunity to, after a season, particularly in the collegiate program, to prepare one of your seniors or one of your juniors coming out early going into the NFL Combine, you've got to believe they're strong enough. Don't try to go back and do another strength cycle. Start working on power development. If you've got a way to measure it with either a, a, a tendo unit, some other type of bar mechanism so you can measure bar speed and power, that's where you need to go. Don't recycle back and try to get them any stronger. I'm sorry I wasn't able to share everything I wanted to today. Maybe I can be asked back next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lord. All right, guys, we're going to break for lunch. We've got about an hour. We're trying to get back around 1230. Uh, please do everything you can to, to stay within this area. We've got a junior day that's coming over there to, uh, to see a quick presentation and then go into